A24 is my favorite film company and I've seen all of their movies. Before we start, I'm well aware that they assisted with the distribution of the Apple TV Plus documentary film The Elephant Queen, but their website doesn't list that as an official 2019 release, so I'm choosing not to include it in this video. In my opinion, this has been their best year and I'm excited to talk about these movies, so let's get into it. This is what I thought of all 20 of their films from 2019 from worst to best. At the bottom of the list, their biggest shit pile of the year is Outlaws, or 1%, whatever it's going by now. This Australian biker movie for idiots can't decide what it wants to be called, which is entirely unsurprising when you take into account just how fucking terrible every second of it is. The characters are unlikable tough guy templates with one trait apiece. Abby Lee is the ever-loyal wife trope that reassures her man he is the toughest of all the grunting tough guys. Nothing happens for a majority of the film and it's boring borderline unwatchable for the first 45 minutes as you're forced to watch annoying people doing repetitive things. A good third of the film is just a gang of tattooed muscly guys drinking and having sex with prostitutes in a bar. They couldn't even get the tattoos right as most of them look fake and some are even peeling off. The music is consistently bad, the editing sucks and it makes the film drag even harder. Everything is predictable despite all of the character motivations making zero sense. I wouldn't have finished it if I wasn't obligated to. One and a half out of ten. Next is Native Son. In this updated take on the 1940 book, Ashton Sanders plays Bigger Thomas, a poor, young, eclectic black man growing up in Chicago who gets a job driving a rich white family around. Ashton plays his character as a low-grade version of Travis Bickle, and you never quite figure out what makes him tick, making it nearly impossible to connect with him. I found it very difficult to take his pseudo-angsty narration seriously as well. The film is a tonal nightmare, constantly shifting genres and jumping all over the place with choppy editing that forgets about subplots and side characters regularly. The music plays a big part in killing the tone, insisting that you should feel a different way than what is happening on screen would imply. It's all so jumbled and forced, and the choices made by characters are so unreasonable at times that I found myself questioning aloud what was going on. It never lost my attention, and there were a few interesting concepts, but this adaptation is pretty bad. Three and a half out of ten. A quick Google search will show that critics have fallen madly in love with The Souvenir, a semi-autobiographical, slow-moving, toxic love story by writer-director Joanna Hogg. The acting is superb from everyone, especially the two leads, the conversations all feel genuine, and the production is technically sound. That's the extent of the positives that I have. I found the movie to be a dry, British nap of a film. Imagine having a mutual friend who you've never hung out with alone before because you have nothing in common, and invite you to a series of formal dinners at his grandparents' house where a bunch of insufferable, bland people you don't know talk about a bunch of shit that you have zero interest in hearing. That's how this film felt for me. I personally disliked nearly every second of the movie. I couldn't have possibly cared less about this woman or her uninteresting life and the fact that I'm gonna have to sit through a part two of this self-important rubbish makes me dread the future. Four out of ten. Next we got Low Tide. It's been a full three years since Bleed for This was released. You know, that movie where Miles Teller is that one boxer? If you don't remember it, I don't blame you at all. It's one of the most average movies that I've ever seen, completely unspecial in every way, and it's only stuck with me over the years due to how exceptionally unremarkable it is. Well, now you can add Low Tide to that list. There isn't anything that bad about Low Tide, there just isn't anything that good either. It's the perfect movie to watch once and then never never think about ever again. Some young men rob houses on the Jersey Shore and stumble upon treasure that tests their friendship. There's the kid brother, the flawed but lovable older brother, the hothead, and the immature one. You've got the love interest, the cops on the trail, the double crossing, and all of the run-of-the-mill borderline suspense that you'd expect to find in a movie like this. It's competently made, the acting is good enough, it's perfectly watchable. It's a movie. 5 out of 10. 
I'm starting to truly believe that we've run out of new ideas for horror movies. The Hole in the Ground bears similarities to The Babadook and a Mexican film called Here Comes the Devil in addition to several others. A single mother and her son move to an old secluded house in the Irish countryside near an ominous sinkhole in the woods and she soon begins to suspect that her son isn't really her son anymore. The film is shot well and it creates an unsettling tone early on as it very, very slowly builds towards a pivotal moment two-thirds of the way through the movie. Once that moment arrived, I realized, oh, this is kinda dumb. I can see some people appreciating the film more than I did, especially if you haven't seen as many horror movies as I have, but the casual scary movie watcher will probably find the film far too slow going, and if you're a horror enthusiast, there isn't much here that you haven't seen already. It's fine as far as horror flicks go, but pretty underwhelming overall. 5 out of 10. Loosely based on true events, the kill team follows a soldier in Afghanistan who is forced to question the orders of his commanding officer after innocent civilians are murdered. The first act wasn't half bad, and it set up a dramatic narrative with a lead character played by Nat Wolf who struggles with conflicting emotions. The film seemed well on its way to creating worthwhile opinions on the mental hardships and strained morals that soldiers face during war, but then it turned into red herring the movie and decided it would rather be a by-the-books exaggerated suspense film with lazy misdirections and characters that regress into one-dimensional bores. Early on, everyone has personalities and autonomy, but they end up feeling less like actual people and more like excuses for the movie to be tense. No one aside from Wolf and his superior, played by Alexander Skarsgård, who was really good, had layers to them by the end of Act 2. The filmmaking is good enough, but the roller coaster reaches the top way too early and the rest of the film is a nosedive into mediocrity. 5 out of 10. Director Guy Nat Native, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, won the Oscar for Best Live Action Short Film with his 2018 release, Skin. This film, also called Skin, is not a feature-length film of that movie like I had assumed, it's a completely different story, from the same director, on the same subject of racism, but different. Brian is a skinhead who was raised in a gang of white supremacists to hate everyone that is different from him. He meets a girl and he decides that maybe this life of hatred isn't what he wants anymore. It's pretty straightforward from a narrative standpoint. It kind of felt like American History X light. The acting was all good, especially Vera Farmiga in a supporting role as the mother of the gang. She was fantastic and incredibly unsettling and I'm surprised there aren't more people talking about her performance. Kind of made me sick watching her to be honest. The the rest of the movie isn't overly impactful and I had a tough time buying it, if that makes sense. Really average movie overall. 5 out of 10. High Life stars Robert Pattinson as Monty, a man raising an infant daughter on a ship traveling through space. The film starts off very mysteriously as it builds a tense atmosphere and allows you to take in the gorgeous visuals and unique score. Monty is a layered character and Pattinson's performance is one of the film's biggest strengths. Once the movie explains what's going on, I found that it lost quite a bit of its intrigue. There are a lot of interesting ideas here on paper, but too many of them are implemented poorly and a handful of scenes seem like they come out of nowhere and are forgotten about just as quickly. The film takes some dark turns, and on numerous occasions I found that what was meant to be shocking was instead unintentionally humorous. Due to these issues, the film drags pretty hard and I lost interest before it had ended. There's plenty to appreciate, but it feels like another couple of drafts were needed to make the story more engaging and less plotting. Five and a half out of ten. Gloria Bell didn't hit nearly the level of cutesy bullshit that the trailer implied it would, marketing itself as how Stella got her groove back for white people, and that's a good thing. Julianne Moore plays a middle-aged woman trying to find love again, hitting up nightclubs and dancing with available divorcees until she forms a connection with John Turturro. She's been one of Hollywood's best since she began her career, and her performance here is once again great. Her and John have wonderful chemistry. I knew the film wasn't going to be for me, and it wasn't, but I was really impressed with how many impressive aspects make up the whole. The direction was well done with solid editing and the score fit nicely. This was actually an English remake of the director's very own film from 2013 and even if that wasn't the case, no one would claim Gloria Bell is overly original, but everything is in its place and it has a level of honesty that should be commended. 6 out of 10 
In the farewell, Chinese-American woman Billy is living in New York when she learns that her grandmother back in China has stage 4 lung cancer. Her family decides to keep this horrible news a secret from the elderly woman to make her last few months less stressful. I typically find Aquafina pretty annoying, but I'm happy to say that she was very impressive in the leading role. However, Zhu Shen Zhao, who I'm probably saying wrong, steals the show as the ill matriarch. I looked her up on IMDb and believe it or not, this is her one and only performance performance. She's lovable and energetic and just a joy to watch. The story has lots of emotional scenes, builds its characters, and explores cultural differences and themes of loss. I like the setup, but I feel that once the main idea was in place, the story just kinda treads water for the second act. I was hoping for a subplot or two to add layers to the narrative, but instead the story feels pretty repetitive until the third act. It's still worth a watch, but I personally won't be rushing back. 6 out of 10. In Fabric is a British dark comedy horror movie about an evil dress that haunts people in the style of a 1970s giallo film. The idea itself is incredible and it made me eager to experience it. The film is very much style over substance and the style worked very well. The score is loud and aggressive and in your face. The cinematography is colorful and grainy and there's wonderful art direction. The story is just... All right. Basically, the film follows the lives of people who purchase the dress from a department store run by the strangest people that you will ever meet, and then you watch as their lives are affected by the evil of the dress. It's perfectly silly and the tone works great, but I didn't find much to grab onto story-wise beyond a couple of good characters and the solid performances. This is one of those films that I can see some people loving and some people absolutely hating. I liked it, I just wanted more from the script. Six and a half out of ten. Cher is that rare A24 film that somehow flew under my radar. I had no clue the movie even existed until it was already released on HBO. The story follows teenage Mandy, who is shown a cell phone video that strongly implies that she was sexually assaulted during a night of partying that she cannot remember. At times, certain monologues made it feel a little bit like a high-level Lifetime movie, but the subject matter was never lessened because of it. I was pretty surprised how honest and unapologetic the film's commentary on sexual assault was. There are several scenes that are uncomfortable and emotionally challenging and you can really feel the conflicting thoughts going through Mandy's mind during the course of the police investigation. This is apparently the lead's first film role which is remarkable considering her nuanced performance. The movie becomes a bit repetitive and drawn out at only 90 minutes and some of the technical aspects are just alright but this is an impressive film that will get you thinking. 7 out of 10 the Death of Dick Long Three friends in small town Alabama have a crazy night of drinking and getting weird. Their shenanigans get a little bit too crazy and their buddy Dick ends up dead. The film is directed by one of the two Daniels that brought us Swiss Army Man, so I knew going in that the film would get pretty insane and a little bit raunchy. From a quick glance, you may find several similarities with the movie Fargo, but I found The Death of Dick Long to have an identity of its own. The story is held on the backs of the engrossing characters and their performances. What may seem at first like caricatures of southern dimwits grow into fully realized people with thoughts and motivations that just so happen to be southern dimwits. The script isn't lazily filled with jokes, rather funny people in hilarious situations. The ironic soundtrack of early 2000s radio rock helps the comedic tone wonderfully. There's some surprisingly successful dramatic content as well to balance the humor. It's not a masterpiece by any means, its presentation is a little plain and there are some pacing hiccups, but it's a lot of fun. 7 out of 10. Uncut Gems is another crushing boulder of anxiety from the Safdie brothers, the guys behind Good Time. Adam Sandler plays a pile of human trash who owns a jewelry shop that sells rare and expensive items to big name clients. He's in deep with the loan sharks, makes risky gambles, and has built a tower of unintelligent decisions so high it could collapse at any moment. The Safdie brothers want you to have a panic attack watching their movies, and their direction gets more impressive with every film that they make. The music is hectic, the cinematography gets in the character's personal space, and the pacing is lightning fast as the perfectly cast actors yell over one another and the sound design rattles your nerves. Sandler isn't your typical protagonist and he's hard to root for. Of all the people after him, he's his biggest enemy. The movie is difficult to sit through at times because it doesn't let up with the assault, but that's the point. I didn't connect with the story as much as I did with Good Time, but this is another great film. 8 out of 10. 
Waves is Trey Edward Schultz's third film after Cretia and It Comes at Night, which were also A24 movies, and I've loved all of them. The film follows a family in Florida who struggle to come together and cope with an awful tragedy. There's a running theme of families in distress in all of Schultz's films, and he has a real talent when it comes to creating tension and directing his actors. The cast is magnificent across the board, and the script demands a lot of range from each and every one of them. The story is an emotional roller coaster with a lot of heavy subject matter and I've always appreciated films that challenge me. The narrative is structured in an uncommon way that makes complete sense, but I found that this also creates a pacing issue as the movie literally stops dead in its tracks and needs to regain its momentum halfway through. Although the first half is noticeably more compelling than the second, the film as a whole is a pretty remarkable character study with characters that you grow to love. 8.5 out of 10. In Climax, a dance group is practicing the routine in a secluded building one snowy night, and then they decide to have a little party. They soon come to find that the punch has been spiked with LSD, and then all hell breaks loose. The film is a fucked up nightmare through the twisted mind of director Gaspar Noé. From the opening dance number on, it is impossible to take your eyes off of the screen, as if the film is grabbing you by the back of your head and forcing you to endure the madness right along with the characters. The cinematography is absolutely astounding putting you in the same mindset as the partygoers and featuring some remarkable choreography. There are numerous extremely long takes where the camera follows the action up and down the halls of the building without a single cut, not giving you a chance to breathe or reset. The direction is unflinching, the cast of mostly first-time actors is great across the board, and the experience is unlike anything that I've ever seen in a film. 9 out of 10. Ari Aster followed up his tremendous feature debut, Hereditary, with Midsommar, another slow-burn horror movie that homages classics of the genre. A group of five friends travel to Sweden to vacation in a small commune and celebrate at a long-standing festival where they meet a bunch of strange fucking people with really weird traditions. There's a constant, unsettling tone that follows you around for the entire film, even when everything on screen appears bright and joyous. The cinematography is jaw-droppingly gorgeous gorgeous, with lush colors and flawless lighting, and the ominous music enhances the tension by adding to the anxiety. I originally really liked the movie, but I gave it a 7 out of 10 due to some underexplored storylines and repetition that made the film feel far too long. Then I saw the director's cut. It's almost a half an hour longer, but it uses every second of its additional time to flesh out the relationships and add meaning to the subplots. The nearly three hour cut is significantly better in my opinion and one of my favorite experiences experiences of the entire year. 9 out of 10. From the very first scene of The Last Black Man in San Francisco, I knew it was going to be something special. The direction from first-timer Joe Talbot is magnificent and dreamlike, featuring some absolutely gorgeous cinematography and the very best musical score of the entire year. I can't stop listening to it. In addition to the changing city, the story is about identity and finding one's place in the world. It feels a bit like if Barry Jenkins were to have directed the themes from last year's Blind Spotting. There's an obvious, undying love for San Francisco at the heart of the film and you can feel it in every shot. Jimmy Fails was great at portraying a version of himself and Jonathan Major's performance as his eccentric best friend Mont is damn near perfect. He's very likely my favorite character of the entire year. There is quite a bit to unpack, the film being about much more than a guy obsessed with a house from his childhood. I loved every second of this film. 9 out of 10. Under the Silver Lake, Andrew Garfield is an unemployed slacker that fills his days with women gawking and conspiracy theories in David Robert Mitchell's stellar follow-up to It Follows. A mysterious girl he meets quickly vanishes and he sets out on a surreal journey through LA to track her down. While this is happening, a serial dog killer is on the loose, a wealthy man has gone missing, and a new band is starting to make waves in the party scene. The film has a lot of analogies, metaphors, symbolism, and hidden clues all over the place and you're forced to question just how much of what you're seeing is actually happening. Even after the film has concluded, you're left with only a trail of obscure clues that you need to follow to make any sense of what you've just seen. Music plays a big part in the story and the noir score by my boy Disaster Piece helped establish a thick atmosphere. Although the film is not for everyone, it is most certainly for me and I've been losing my mind digging for answers since I saw it a year ago, just as the director intended. 9 out of 10. 
And the best A24 film of 2019 is The Lighthouse. Robert Eggers' follow-up to The Witch is a masterpiece of psychological horror. Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe play two old-timey lighthouse keepers who deal with pesky seagulls and violent storms on an isolated island in the late 1800s as they chug alcohol and slowly lose their fucking minds. Both men pour everything that they have into their performances as they devolve into unrestrained madness. It's a sparring match between two actors who have never been better. Edgar's direction is unparalleled and he's created one of the most unique experiences that I have ever had with a film. The movie is visually stunning, shot on film in black and white with an almost square aspect ratio that adds to the claustrophobia. The score sets an uneasy tone that sticks with you throughout. I was always on the edge of my seat, worried that something awful was about to happen. The story is ambiguous and full of visual metaphors that you're tasked with piecing together in order to make sense of the wild ride. The lighthouse is completely gripping and there isn't a single aspect of the filmmaking that could have been improved. It's one of the best films of the entire decade. 10 out of 10.